Listening to Off Planet Radio at OffPlanetRadio.com. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, I have a very special guest with me today. We're going to talk about some pretty sobering, pretty intense subjects that have to do largely with the alternative community at large and what's been going on for a long time and the co-opting of of what we've called the disclosure movement. Largely the quest to understand what's going on behind the scenes, not only just in our governments, our financial structures, our social systems, but also in terms of what goes on beyond the veil of this world, this planet, this realm, whatever you want to call it. We can debate about all that as much as we need to, but the, the, the thrust of what we're going to do today is we're going to go into the evolution of Corey Good. Um, how we got to the place where we now have a, a massive rock star type of mentality around so-called disclosure speakers. And as kind of a predicate to the whole conversation, I'll just box in some of the history of why I'm doing this and how I got involved. Very simple narrative is that roughly about three and a half weeks ago or so, I posted on the Facebook my impressions of what I saw when I went over and looked at the Corey Good material on his website and on his, on his Facebook page. I had largely ignored the Corey Good, David Wilcock drama that's been playing out for a number of years. Um, we hit on it lightly when Shane the Ruiner was on my show last year. And I'm not obsessive about anything. I, you know, it's a moving target. But what I saw so appalled me so shocked me in the level of deception and the level of mind hive mentality that's now playing out specifically around the blue avian meme and the secret space program and also the community at large and how it's being held in thrall in cults of personality rather than dealing with substantive research and intuitive understanding of complicated issues and my guest today is someone who was there at ground zero in the corey good story um, one of the, one of the principles of journalism, and I rarely go into journalism, but I like the principle is to find primary sources for everything. There is no more primary source than the person who first interviewed the person we know as Corey Good and was there as this whole thing played out on the forum at Project Avalon. And so I want to welcome as our guest today, Christine Anderson. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you, Randy. And um, I just want to make a personal statement why I'm joining you today. Yep. Uh, I think this is vital that w I'm not here to trash a person out of any rancor, out of any deceptions, any betrayals, or anything of that nature that are very much a part of our human emotional makeup. Yes. Um, I've had ample time to review my own participation, how I got hooked into it, what drove me, and the subsequent fallout, which was painful. I mean, there's no, mm -hmm. I can't be anything but honest. It was very painful, but it was one of those extreme lessons in life uh, that you learn from, and it's experiential. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about my experiences with Corey Good, Bill Ryan, Project Avalon Forum as a moderator, and how I got drawn into this. Um, I was the first person that put out anything public on Corey Good. Um, I had met Corey on the forum. Um, he wrote a lot. He was an active poster. Um, I became interested in what he was talking about when he started talking about the Native American culture in America and uh, the deeper aspects of the archaeological discoveries, uh, linking back some of our origins to the Celts and a lot of unknown history, right, that's been covered up. So that was what my hook with him was. So, I mean, that's where I got interested in what he was bringing forward. Um, so during that time, uh, we were also, Bill and I, m many people don't know we were married. I was living with him in Ecuador. Um, 
uh, he put me on the forum first as a member and then as a moderator. And we had a community there. We had bought some land and we were forming a community. So at some point along the line, the suggestion was made that we talk to Corey and his wife about them becoming members of our community. Um, and that's how I started my Skype conversations with Corey on a personal level. So once we started Skyping with each other, it went on for about two years. We would most often over our morning coffee, we were in the same time zone, get together on Skype and share our lives, share our intuitions, share our data. During that time, I started a very, um, un, not, nothing I was looking for, and you talked about it in one of your older um, <clears throat> In, uh, interviews or presentations, Randy, I started having peripheral vision. Like I would start coming yes, out of yes, sleep. Yes, yes, I just morning. reposted that a few days ago. I know you yeah. did. I always thought that was so uh, synchronistic. But that's actually what's happening. I was started to have, I would call innate remote viewing, mm -hmm. not techniques or anything. And I started picking up data of all sorts. I mean, ancient technologies, off planet uh, presences. Uh, some days it would be very, very specific. I would see one example was I saw submarines off the coast of North America. So I was sharing all of this with Corey, and then he would come back and he would either verify or share his own uh, remote viewing or mm -hmm. his own data. It was a, a it was a relationship of friendship. So as any person you get to know, you start to get to know their personal dramas, traumas. And also on the forum, I was dealing with, as a moderator and as a friend to many uh, people who have been through MK Ultra programs, I was dealing with contactees, abductees, uh, all sorts of things, people from the Scientology field that had had a lot of recall work done. So you, you get the picture, you know, you're on this large forum uh, and you're dealing with a mass of consciousness a lot of them, if not all of them, because I think all humans are, are mind, mind control. Um, yeah, we're in agreement on that. <laughs> you're dealing with triggers, you're dealing with trigger words, you're dealing with purposeful mm -hmm. infiltration, you're dealing with so much stuff that, you know, it's pretty overwhelming. How do you navigate it? So back to Corey. Um, it became part of what I started doing sort of spontaneously, I initiated an Avalon 24-7. It was a Skype chat of people who felt that they had healing abilities. We were primarily working with uh, Gaia Earth Energy fields, but we would get together routinely. We would do what you can call remote viewing or some shamanic work, but it was always directed by spirit. There wasn't an agenda. There wasn't an intent stated. It was just like a call, and um, that was part of what brought me back to Corey as a friend and supporter for him to start to move out of his deep programming and traumas, which are multiple. Okay. I'm not an expert. I'm not a therapist. I don't even say I'm a healer anymore because I find that's a false term. I was a friend. I was first and foremost a friend to the extent that I helped him with the other women on the Avalon 24 seven Skype chat, get out of some very, very dark situations. And I don't need to go into them, uh, but they involve demonics, they involve SRI, they involved a whole bunch of things. Uh, even to the extent that I actually lent him money to get out of a situation he was in so he could get his own home where I later visited him. Um, so that's the, f and I wanna say this about Corey, I, still have, and when I listened to the second interview I did with him, I have a great deal of compassion and love for him as a human being, as a sentient soul, but a highly compromised one. I don't know the Corey Good that's out there today in the CGI world and the co-opted, you know, moneyed world, we're gonna turn spirituality into a money-making enterprise or the disclosure, or whatever. That person, I don't know. I know the Corey that I knew. And so um, if you want to interrupt me any time and ask me questions. Well, I'm just going to ask you to baseline, if you can, the rough timeline where you began interacting with. Uh, I can tell you on the 25th of September, I actually did go back because I'm lost in time. I don't understand time. <laughs> uh, I had to actually go back and look at my Skype records and things. Mm -hmm. So I met Corey on Skype in September, I believe it was. Yes, of 2013. 
and it wasn't really until April of 2015 that we cut off contact. And the real interfering time came. I made the first interview with him, which was not an interview. Okay, I want to get that really clear. I was visiting Dallas, Texas. I was doing some work for a friend. Um, and I met Corey in his home. I spent six weeks all together in Dallas. Uh, during that time, I probably visited him half a dozen, maybe more times. I went shopping with his wife. I sat with his kids. I played with his dog, uh, had meals with them. And in the second interview, he's very clear. He couldn't speak to me at first. We knew without verbal communication that he wanted to get something recorded. He wanted to get some of these memories out. And it took several visits, a lot of trust. So one day I sat down with him with a little recording device, put it on his couch, and he started talking. So it wasn't meant for publication, although I think we both knew that there was a possibility of that. I had started a Avalon YouTube channel called The Faces of Avalon, and the purpose was for members of the Project Avalon Forum to share their music, their creations, their stories, whatever, and that was why it was, uh, so that was the first place it was ever published. Uh, I think it took him about, maybe about three weeks afterward, um, he said, okay, go ahead, you can put it up on YouTube. We had maybe 500 subscribers at the time. It was very limited to the Project Avalon Forum at that moment. And this is what I, I really want to get into this as clearly as I can, because I think this is elemental that we, as human consciousness, understand how deeply programmed we were, okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Corey is a programmed individual. Yes. I don't doubt that he was programmed as a child. I don't doubt that he was abused and put through programs. I don't doubt any of that. Um, so, and he was in a free flow consciousness recall that was recorded. It was unedited and it was uploaded onto YouTube. Within a very short period of time, he, I, and Bill, I think, started getting uh, private messages and contacts from people going, oh my God, some people fell asleep during that, listening to that. Some people couldn't listen to it. And a lot of people started having spontaneous recall of their own programming. Okay. Yes, which is also, you know, all of what you just described there is an authentic process that occurs whenever you begin to do this, even from the free flow state of downloading memories, detached imagery, and then what happens when it flows through the consciousness of other people who enter into that, 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 that psychological and intuitive realm? Yeah, and you know, I mean, even to the extent that one man wrote me that he actually woke up out of a sleep state. He had uh, marks on his arms from where they had handcuffed him and cinched him, and he remembered being injected in the back of the neck. So I had people writing me, Corey had people writing him, and I'm sure Bill had people writing him, all right? Um, so all of a sudden we're in this miasm of mind control trigger beings being triggered. It's taken me a long time, Randy, to try to put this together. Why did they pick up Corey Good? He was a nobody. Uh, at the time I knew him, he was suffering from PTSD. Uh, he was on disability. He had worked not in software programming field, but in the hardware aspect of working on servers and things like that. He had had an accident at work. Uh, he was living in this house <clears throat> um, with really no income. He was, he was on benefits. Uh, he was uh, very, very uh, anxiety prone because of trying to support two young children and his wife. He had no income. Stacy wasn't working, yeah, I said her name. Um, and so, you know, he was in an extremely vulnerable state of being, extremely vulnerable. Um, so how all this came down, right? Um, and I'm gonna give a little timeline a little bit forward here. I left uh, Texas, went back to Ecuador, and then I came to Mexico to visit my family. Um, and at that time, all this was kind of going on behind the scenes in, uh, in Avalon. A lot of things were coming out. Um, Corey and I decided to do a second interview, right? And I recorded it here in Mexico. Meanwhile, Bill Ryan 
put up the Corey Good, what would you call it, session recall recording onto his YouTube channel, uh, which has 33,000 subscribers, and he titled it Whistleblower Testimony. Now, on a personal level, I was infuriated. On a very personal level, because I wasn't consulted, nobody actually said that was how it was going to be presented. I know Corey agreed that the interview be put up there. I'm going to call it an interview for shortness. Uh, but calling it whistleblower testimony was such a misdirect. You know, because that set into the minds yep. of anybody watching it that, that we were dealing with somebody that actually was from the deep inside government. Let me slip, let me slip something in here because this is a problem that I've had for a while now with the application of the term whistleblower and how it's been used. The term whistleblower itself is actually a very legal term in, in, in how it's applied within governmental structures, specifically here in the United States with the whistleblower acts that protect wit witnesses who are coming forward with information that's crucial to the public interest, to the interest of the government. And the term has been co-opted by key people in the media and used as a branding in order to create the impression that somehow there's an official layer to all of this. I don't like the term because of the fact that it's got the legal implication and I also don't like it because it places an onus on the people who are doing witness to then provide evidence and all kinds of documentation, which as you and I both know, in most of what we talk about and deal with isn't really possible. Exactly, and so yes, you're right. So, you know, there never was and there will never be documentation as Corey Good as a, a whistleblower. There never will be. This is, it, it just doesn't exist. I know him well enough, I know enough about his history to know what happened to him, and I don't well, think Well, and you know as well as I do that within the purview of so-called black budget operations, secret programs, and the so-called Illuminati, there is no documentation extant that we could access. This, this, exactly. These are not people that keep records in hard copy that can be retrieved and, and that you can file a FOIA to receive. No, and I, I won't get into it right now, but this is what I've learned through all of this. It's like the only way we as consciousness can actually get to the truth is by seeing the patterns because there, there's actually very few patterns laid out. I don't care how many overlays and rituals and hyperdimensional spaces created around us. There's a very distinct pattern that can be discerned. And so then you can have your own access to the discernment of what is truth and what is not. But as long as we're triggered by words like whistleblower, insider, super soldier, uh, secret space program, we're not going to be as any individual able to see these patterns. Um, so we'll go back to Corey. Um, I did a second interview with him, which is probably, I listened to it last night, I haven't listened to it in years. Um, it's probably the most coherent Corey Good interview out there because what had happened was after our contact, Corey on his own, okay, uh, had, was able to uh, do a sub entity detachment. I'll call it that, okay. He actually was able to identify entities that were, were running him and he was able to clear himself. How he did that, that's his story, it's all on record. Um, however, all of a sudden, there was this very coherent Corey Good. He felt good about himself. He felt like he was in his own place, right? He felt like now he had a chance to run his life. He wasn't in the victim mentality that is also so hugely embedded in people. And we started talking about consciousness and that we human beings are the ones that are being used to project the conscious realities in which we're living in, which is the systematic destruction or co-option of our own natural creative abilities. And it is very good, I recommend it if anybody wants to listen to that versus where Corey is right now. What happened after that second interview was recorded, I was still in Mexico, I sent it to Bill Ryan to be uh, edited and uploaded to YouTube. 
Uh, we got a message almost that it was an impossible interview. It was a, I was told by Bill it was a ridiculous interview. I was told that it, was, it wasn't publishable. And the excuse he gave, and that's on record on the Avalon forum because he put it out publicly, that the audio was so bad that you, we couldn't be heard. So both of us, Corey and I, were like, it's not that bad, and I, we don't know why Bill's not wanting to publish it. Um, so Corey said, well, it doesn't matter. I'll send it to one of my insider you know, sources, and I will have that. He's an audio technician, and he'll clean it up. Well, that turned out to be Shane the Ruiner who I had not had had contact with before, right? But you know, the way Corey right, right, at yeah. the moment started to present it to me, already flags were going up in me. You know, it's like, wait a minute, we're friends and you're calling your friend some sort of insider, right? Uh, however, that uh, the audio's not bad on that interview, it never was. It was right after that okay, that everything started to go to hell in the handbasket uh, on the Avalon forum in my relationship with Bill, my relationship with Corey started to be effect because what really happened is the content, you know, like I want to publish this, Bill doesn't want to publish it. Well, why shouldn't we publish it? And uh, it got Shane involved in it. A lot of stuff went on on the forum. And right around that time, a new member came onto the forum under the name of Jesse Ames, I believe. And you'll, you'll recognize this, Randy, and I really welcome any comments you want to give to how these things happen. Um, <clears throat> this personality, fictitious or whatever, uh, started triggering everybody. It was, it, it turned into what seemed at that moment a pretty harmonious forum into total upheaval. I mean, and I was getting emails from people I really respected on the forum that are, you know, were MK Ultra or were contactees that I really have learned to trust over time. Uh, they were sending, he's using trigger words, he's triggering people, he's dangerous, he's actually using uh, words that are meant to trigger suicides. Uh, and I started responding. I mean, it kind of freaked me out that we were letting this person, unknown, who said he was an insider who had very, very important information to give the whole forum run rampant. And when that person wasn't moderated right away, uh, I had, at that moment, I had my first real wake up, well, wait, what's going on underneath the scene here in Avalon is not okay. It is not okay because somebody's, you know, there's agreements whether they're conscious or unconscious. That so when you made. say he was not moderated, are we to assume here that there was some sort of understanding or I don't like to use the word order, but maybe we go there that this person would not be moderated because on Avalon, as in most well-governed forums, the mods are the people that sit on top of the posts and basically they have to make horrible decisions sometimes about it, but they're also the people that understand the, environment that's being created in the forum. So I'm thinking there was some sort of top-down command here that said this guy is allowed free reign. Is that what you're saying? That's basically what was going on. And I, I'm going to make one little more jump back to Corey, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit deeper about that. Um, when I got back to Ecuador, okay, Corey was getting massive, massive, I mean, I don't know, hundreds, thirties, fifties, I don't know. He was getting a lot of people coming forward to him personally and telling their story. And he sort of took on the role of like protecting them and, you know, I'm going to, you know, help them deprogram or find help or whatever. And I'm going to say this just publicly because I need to, okay. I had by that point become aware enough that people are programmed uh, that almost everybody's programmed to some extent, unless you have enough personal integrity and truth becomes your, your cause, you know, your inner cause, not the outer one, the inner one. And so I'm in my living room in Ecuador and, and Bill's sitting at his computer and with his back to me and he's furious. He's furious because Corey wasn't turning over his, his information. He was, it, Bill didn't feel that Corey was adequate 
or trained or professional enough to deal with these people. And he wanted access to these people. And I saw Bill get triggered. I did. I saw him go from fairly rational to enough of a state of suppressed rage that it actually erupted where he told me, get out of the room right now or I could kill you. Okay, so I'm not saying this to trash him. I'm not saying this to justify anything. I'm just pointing it out that this is the level of danger that we're dealing with when you're living with or deeply involved in this because you don't know where another's triggers are, whether they're psychological or they're programmed. You know, what's interesting about this too is that, and I'm trying to explain things because there's so many different levels of audience to, that hear these shows. I've been in electronic media since early 2000s on the internet. I, I was doing radio and then I kind of transitioned into the digital era of doing what became known as podcasting and streaming. In that time, there was a moment around 2004, 2005, when I began to understand that energetically there are signatures inside of electronic communications, even email, posts on forums, you begin to sense things and you look at it and you think, no, that's, that's crazy. These are, this, is, this is text on a screen. Mm -hmm. So the listeners who don't know this need to understand the huge level of communication that comes through the internet that's not part of the base code. It's simply part of the energetic transmissions that are occurring as a result. Of, this is a neural network that we're dealing with here on every level. So continue, please. Yeah, definitely, definitely, Randy. And with the implementation of uh, more and more technology from the smart screen, smartphones, and all of this, there are subliminals in everything, everything. So this is why I'm talking about this. It's not in any other way, but to watch it with your own eyes, to be involved with it. And what happened from that moment was actually Bill triggered Corey, okay? He triggered his paranoia. And but at that point, I was seeing that there were two irrational beings who had been triggered by each other and others and this electronic media that you're speaking to. And it just went into all out war. Right. I mean, when you trigger a, you know, this, when you trigger a PTSD uh, person, they're going to fight for their survival tooth and nail. Okay. They're going to scratch at anything that gets in their way because you've now triggered them into a very level of survival. And that's really what happened with Corey. So he started digging information on Bill. He started making accusations. I don't want to go into any, all of that. I was still Corey's friend. I was sitting there between these two men and, you know, trying to find my own truth or own way of discerning or how do I deal with this? You know, personal relationships, personal lives, everything was affected. Everything was. And, uh, you know, so I'm not going to make any claims about what Corey found or didn't find about Bill. But it, both of them at that point were, they were an enemy standpoint, right? And enter at that point, David Wilcock and Carrie Cassidy. Now, I was still friends with Corey at that time, too. He was still trying to convince me that I was in danger. You know, he was throwing information at me as much as he could about what he had dug up on Bill. And, you know, I'm not even going to say I believed most of it or I didn't. Some of it had validity. Some of it didn't. Um, it, uh, and I, Corey would copy and paste his Skype messages with David and with Carrie to me. Okay, so there was a courting of Corey Good, right? Carrie wanted him, David wanted him. And David won. Now, my question right now, Randy, and it's something I'd really like to more talk about, is why Corey Good? Why a person on a disability, okay, who had never really, no documentation for who he was, what was it about him that people were fighting for. I mean, this, it's always bugged me, you know, because I was left with what, what happened here? What happened here? So, yeah, there was. And, uh, you know, Corey took the stance that David was a good guy and it wasn't going to have anything to do with Carrie. And he got really pissed off at Carrie. I even came to his defense at one point with Carrie. 
when she used his name on an interview, even though I knew everybody by that time knew who Corey Good was. Um, and I just started to see the facade of it all. I started to see everybody as players. I started to see them all playing these roles and I was like, who's programming this? Who's behind this and why Corey? Why, what is it about Corey or anybody that gets propelled out there into what he's into right now, okay, as this a celebrity figurehead for the disclosure movement, as we can call it, that he's the poster boy, that he's made up, that he is given script to speak to. Why him? You see, that's, that was my deeper question, and that's why I feel like at some point right now, uh, I'm ready to talk about it. And it has to do with, with what you were saying, Randy. I have found, and I've listened to a lot of people, that there are certain voices, certain energies, okay, that someone carries. Yes, absolutely, you, yeah. And they, they penetrate through us, and they make us trust them. They make us trust them. And Corey is one of those. Corey is one of those. People innately at first wanted to trust him. So it, it, it and then you start to paint the face on, give it the, the personality you want to give it. And you've got somebody there that's doing the pure bidding of those that are controlling. Yeah, it's basically a classic Pygmalion syndrome. I mean, this is this is actually very classic. It's almost like you've got somebody who's the raw clay for creation that can then be further advanced out into the wider eye. Hey, we're getting nasty interference here. Hang on, I got a truck going by. Let me just let it pass. <laughs> and you know, and. And, um, and to underline or under, to underline and underscore it, Randy, because the original recording of Corey Good had such an effect that it was actually waking people up to their own programming. We know we'll call them the controllers. I, you know, we can. There's enough information about you know what this is about. At all costs, are not going to let somebody that has that voice has that innate ability to bring forward without him wanting to, that wasn't his intention, but he was literally started deprogramming people. It, it was something about what he talked about. He talked about Peter Pan. He talked about, you know, his school, uh, schoolhood episodes. And when he was speaking it, he was speaking it from inside himself. And it did have that effect. See, that's what makes this so hard for people like us and why, you know, and I watched passively from the sidelines as the Corey Good thing played out on Avalon. A lot of people don't know I'm an Avalon member and I have been since probably 2011, 2012. To me, what I observed passively without engaging the whole conversation was the emergence of somebody I felt actually kind of a simpatico with mm -hmm. for all the reasons that you just stated that we have we have very wounded injured people who are in, innately gifted people and also people that have been so heavily tampered with and we want we want to give them every every opportunity to expand that but at the same time, understand that as with anybody who has been through any kind of traumatic programming, there are layers to this where there is both false and true programming information layered in. So we're kind of going through a process of sifting in all of this. So it makes it really difficult because on a personal level, we connect. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're are connected. I mean, the, the, the thing yeah, is, we no, are there's connected. no way around it. That's what that community did. I mean, the genius behind this was for whatever Avalon is or was or will become, there was a process there that melded a whole bunch of people together in ways that were totally unpredictable. And since we're on this particular 
Sorry, the, the internet connection is going unstable. Oh, gosh. Okay, let's see if that clears up. Okay, so now we got a plane going overhead. Yeah, you know, this, <laughs> this is really entertaining with, for people to not to understand that we started out with crystal clear bandwidth here and, and it's stalling and we've got planes. And Anyway, yeah. let me clarify my own thinking here for a minute. I want to I, I zero in on the first interview that you did with Corey because this is actually the key to understanding the transition. So if I can take you back for a minute, Christine. Sure. Sure. Um, that first recording you did with Corey in Texas, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. A at his home. At his um, home. Now, the Corey Good that you met there, eye to eye, face to face, in the room, you have described as basically somebody that was basically pretty shattered at that point and attempting to work through a process of recovery of memories and a recovery of understanding about what was going on inside of him. Take us from there psychologically to the second interview and the transition that you sense between the first and second interviews and also the time interval between those two. Okay, the time interval was about two, two months, I believe. Um, and I was no longer in Texas, I was now in Mexico. Uh, from that point forward, what happened with Corey, and it, it, it is, he wrote all about it, it's still on public record, I believe, unless they've hidden it on the Avalon Forum, is that when I was there with him, and I don't think it was in the first recording, um, he had a dream sequence, a very uh, vivid, lucid dream sequence, where he spotted an entity that he later um, uh, named his gatekeeper, okay? And he said when he spotted this entity, he was a surprise, but the entity was more surprised even than him. He forgot about it and then subsequently remembered it and on his own went into that space. And we, we know about these spaces, you do, I do, and others do, uh, where he was able to draw that entity out and it was what he calls his gatekeeper. It was the primary lockdown on this consciousness. When he removed that entity from him, we're calling it an entity because I don't know what type of entity it really was, um, a huge sequence of demonic energy started pouring out of his being, okay? That went from dark astral beings, and I know other friends that have had these, also these type of episodes by themselves, where they expel all this dark energy, where demonics come out of yeah, them, where exactly. other types of things. And it's terrifying to live with that shit. Oh, it's a life. psychotic break at that point. I know, because I've experienced yeah. it too. It's yeah. part of our you know, healing process. It's, it's part of the healing process. It's, it, it's exactly right. And it takes a lot of courage and, and, and integration at that moment to hold yourself, you know, once you've come out of that chatter. And so Corey was at that point, but because of that, he felt, oh, I did something. I finally did something within me that's cleared me. He became much more lucid, much more transparent. He even talks about his dog wouldn't go close to him, and now his dog's sitting on his lap with him. Uh, you know, certain things start to change. I mean, you know, if you can imagine in his household, I mean, even his children were traumatized not by actions of their mother and father, but by living in that type of an environment. Then the, both of his children were highly capable and came in with innate abilities, right? So the whole atmosphere around him cleared. And so then we did the second interview. We didn't know where we were gonna go. We weren't planning on anything. We just thought, hey, it's a good idea if we do another you know, uh, conversation. And you can hear in that particular interview, and he does actually quote David Wilcock, um, source field investigations. Um, he, he's really clear about how our innate abilities have been co-opted by all these control factions and how we are being used to create this dastardly reality that we call normal life. And so 
that's pretty much it. And then I actually asked the question to myself last night, why did Bill have such a problem with this, right? I could have listened to it again and see what it was that maybe Bill Ryan didn't want to hear or why he wanted to suppress this interview. And, you know, and I, I, I can't answer that, but that was why I listened to it last night. So there we are, we're there. And from that point forward, uh, all the relationships of openness, transparency, let's work this out, let's figure it out together, flew out the window with no retrieval. Now, Bill Ryan has done an interview with uh, the Dark Journalist, yeah. pretty extensive interview. Uh, mm -hmm. The first hour of that is available publicly. And he states in that interview that he took the, he calls it a dictaphone recording that you did with Corey in the first interview. And he says that he rather substantially edited that recording, um, doing a comment on, on how much editing was done in order to, quote, Bill, make it presentable to an audience to professionalize it, which is, is the way he characterized it in the interview with Dark Journalist. Um, I listened to that interview and I actually didn't pick that up. Uh, as far as I know, um, I don't have the original court recording, Bill has it. Uh, all I know that he did was clean up the audio. Okay. I wasn't told by him. Okay. That's all. I was meant if he had it, it's on his I don't think the original on the faces of we're getting we're getting break up again hold on a second let me let's see i'm going to pause this for a second okay as far as the uh original recording the dictaphone it was the dictaphone recording of corey um i know of no editing per se of it okay other than good no that's that. fine um See, this is another thing, and I'm going to jump right into it. Why not, Randy? Um, Bill Ryan's been off the scene for a long time. Yeah. Okay? Oh, off, an awful long time. He's, you know. So when he got picked up by the dark journalists, and I I listened to part of that interview. Frankly, I can't listen to too much of anybody anymore. I'm so deep in my own process. Um the thought that came to me, and this is just spontaneous, so I'm just going to bring it out. The thought came to me, ah, they picked him to run the narrative on the Corey Good story. Because it's a deeper story than I believe, because if Bill doesn't come forward with his own participation in it, his own triggering, his own emotional responses, his own true, true participation in bringing Corey Good forward, then we're only getting a slip view. We're only seeing a slip view. And you know and I know that when something becomes important enough, and the fact that he used your name, you know, I mean, that's why I got involved in this, Randy. I saw the Facebook post, I saw the article, and I went, wait a minute, what's happening here? You know, so they designate somebody to run the narrative. Somebody has a reputation, they build up the reputation again, they put them out there as the personality and the voice for because they know that they can yeah, drive the cops. Yeah. And see, I'll just insert this here. That or there was never an article written by me. That was a Facebook post based on my impressions, again, of what I saw as the output of the um, sphere of being alliance work that Corey was doing. When I looked at it, I just basically, it, it was sufficiently alarming enough that I shouted it out on Facebook. I did not do exhaustive work on the, there was no article. This was, and it got posted on the Avalon by, I know who posted it. It was, a, it was a friend of mine who participates on Avalon. And when Bill saw it, he picked it up and he ran with it. And, exactly. you know, I would be otherwise grateful to see my thoughts go viral, which they in fact have, except for what we're now talking about, which is how this is being deployed as a means to control a narrative, good, bad, or indifferent. The narrative is being spun and controlled from both sides, from the camp mm -hmm. of David Wilcock, Michael Sala, Corey Good, Gaia TV, and on the other side from the Project Avalon side and the distaff part of the community that has a problem with Corey Good. And, and you know, mm -hmm. we, wind up in, we wind up in the middle of a, of a battle here 
that we neither created nor did we escalate because this wasn't me attempting to push something out virally and it's not you attempting to push out something virally. No, I, I actually quietly wrote about my, I saw the CGI yes. stuff come out and about probably about a year ago now, the first CGI images of Corey and all that. And it turned my stomach, you know, it's nauseating. It's actually nauseating when you know somebody. And I felt at that point that I had to speak something and I chose to do it on a very our earth and past forum in a very quiet way. Um, a lot of the people that visit that forum are still members or former members of Avalon. And so I felt like I needed to state something and I was happy enough to state it and leave it. Right. I mean, it's out there. Like you say, the truth is out there. It's in you, but it, the truth is out there. I mean, anybody can do their own research. They can develop their own discernment factors. They can see the patterns as they're laid out. Avalon is a pattern. Project Avalon has past history of patterns of behavior. You pull forward the new whistleblower, the Charles, the, the next big you know piece of information, and now we've got the truth. And, and then you, you promote that person, you put them up on a pedestal, and when it turns out that they're not quite in your control or you, you know, they're going off on a tangent that you don't want them to go on or, and you've created a whole stir of controversy and you've got all these people all stirred up and they're all following rabbit holes that go nowhere, then you trash that person. I mean, it's gone on and you on. Know, you actually isolated something there that's interesting. We've seen this persistent pattern in the alternative media, and boy, do I hate that term. I'm looking for something to replace it. Um, whether it's been Bill Brockbrader was another figure that it's happened to, where we, yeah. we, we bring somebody forward, we elevate them, and then we collapse the platform out from underneath them. We're often with horrific, if not lethal results, by the way. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> this brings me to why this conversation is so important and why you and I are doing this on the level that we're doing it. It's just a little under a year ago that we saw the death of Max Spears, uh, another figure that was heavily promoted, another person that had some very legitimate things to bring forward, but also, there, frankly, there was a fair level of bullshit that was being proffered as well because of the need to constantly build and escalate a narrative. Whatever the outcomes can be, in the case of Max Spears, what we had was a mysterious death. And what followed in the aftermath was so much clamor and confusion, chaos, psychic mind screwing, like I've never mm -hmm. seen before, that it, it, not, it, it took a lot of people out. There's a lot of people who are off, the, off on the sidelines now that don't want to deal with any of this because of the psychological warfare that was leveled as a result of the, 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 the demise of Max Spear. Spears. I would like to speak to that and Go. link that to Corey. Yes. Because what Max Spear had to me, okay, was he was a, a person trying to break his programming, okay? Severe, severe. He suffered from the same PTSD, uh, there were drugs involved, I mean, you know, whether they were psychotropic drugs or whatever, to lower his levels of anxiety, which he must have run at constantly, being in what he was involved in. I'd never met him personally, but what he had in him was he had an ability to speak through all of those layers and touch something in the human heart. He really did have that because after his death, the amount of people that came to me and spoke with me and a spontaneous uh, contact with him yes. uh, brought forward that, you know, and, and so, you know, these people that have, they either have to be absolutely controlled, used, utilized, or they will be taken out or they'll take themselves out because frankly, the pressure of being a conscious being trapped in these programs and trying to find yourself and trying to find your heart um, and get out of it can be a death sentence. It can be a death sentence. So whether it's by your own hand, by the pressure put upon you because you can't take it anymore, or whether it's by a uh, ritual or whatever, I don't know what happened to him, okay? But I do know that it, for me, I contacted his spiritual essence 
and that's the only part of Max that I have anything to say anything to, right? Which is the common essence of all of us, yeah, yeah. okay? And so when we get lost in the narratives, the personalities, the figureheads, the, uh, the facades, of, you know, we're not going to get down to a deeper truth. And this is why I, I'm so speaking with you today, Randy, because until enough consciousness on the planet can see the pattern, see how they're rolled out, get out of the scandalous narrative and the newest one on the block, and start to dig a little deeper, we as humanity are still in this fucked up reality. I'm sorry, you know, and it's real. It's a really fucked up reality. It it's, is. It's, well, and see, we're all being pulled into a vortex here. And this is the division within the alternative communities. And I struggle with this. And I struggle even when I call something out like I did on this particular occasion. Um, it doesn't feel good. Because no. deep down inside, we're all... And, and we're sifting through trauma. We're sifting through each other's trauma. There's a fair amount of overlay in all of that because I feel you, you feel me, we contact. The background conversations that I have are probably just like the ones that you have. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've repeatedly told people for a very long time now, at least the last three to four years has been, if you're not already public, you may want to stop and consider whether you want to do so. Because you're basically now going to do a high wire act in front of a lot of people who have a spectator mentality about this. They're going to look to trip you up and pick you apart. I wouldn't do it. I've made some recordings of my own memories, my own experiences and things. And those recordings are not public. And I'll just say this, if you, anybody wants to see the recordings, there's a vetting process for that. Because I'm not going to even put my own stuff out there. And that's, that's really hard to say when you've worked, uh, as, as you and I have for many years on this, um, asking people to come forward and give their story. But given the current venue and given the high stakes that are now being leveled as a result of Corey Good being escalated into this, this, this pantheon of rock star status, I would tell people deeply, reconsider what you put into the public venue, reconsider whether you're strong enough to withstand the pressures that are going to come. So this is actually a compassionate message that's a reach out to all people in the experience or communities, as well as to Corey Good, because quite frankly, I don't want to see Corey Good become the next Max Spears. Exactly. I, it's really well, well said, Randy, and it really does speak to it because, I mean, I'll be very transparent here. You know, I had my little incursion out there in, as a public person, right? I'm a public person, right? I've got videos. I speak my yeah, truth. Yeah, like it or not, we, we've already done that. Right, you know, and yet uh, during this whole time, and it actually came from me coming back from Standing Rock, and coming yeah. back into this reality and then having to assess in myself, first of all, okay? It always starts inside yourself. Why am I speaking? Why am I putting out information? What am I looking for? And you have to go through a checklist, okay? Money, fame, glory, uh, being right. I mean, there's all that gamma. You have to do this checkpoint inside yourself. And, you know, I mean, there was a point where I thought, well, you know, I mean, maybe people will appreciate what we're doing and they'll, you know, they'll help support us. I mean, I've given my whole life to this since 2011, right? I mean, I haven't, you know, and I've got $2 donation here and, you know, somebody gave 80 ones, you know, it's like, well, no, I'm not going to make a livelihood out of this. And, uh, and right there in that is the co-opting of how they're going to go after the disclosure truth or alternative community, okay? They're going to put in us that we can make a living off of this. They're going to turn spirituality, spiritual truth speak, into something like Teal Swan or all these other people out there that are now personalities on the circuit and they're getting money for it, right? That's CCN, that's all of it, Diam TV, okay? That's the hook. That is the hook. So I had to determine for myself that I wasn't going to make myself a internet personality. Uh, it's antithetical to me anyways, or even try or expect or desire 
financial return, number one. Number two, am I looking for recognition? Am I, am I empty enough inside that, you know, that I need other people to come to me and tell me who I am and, and really appreciate me and they want to follow me? I don't want that either. That is such a huge responsibility that I want nothing to do with it. So I got really quiet, Randy. I've become, I've been, and also, I don't need to make any more statements, noise out there, okay, to promote anything that I have inside myself. When there's other people like yourself, Elisa, and, I mean, there's so much noise out there in the internet. I don't want to just join the chorus. You know, I'm speaking today because I feel it's vital that I speak today because my own inner spiritual self says you must speak what you know about this. And nobody in the alternative community, okay, that promoted Corey Good from Dr. Sala to anybody else out there that's done this, David Wilcock, Carrie Cassidy, nobody, okay, wanted to speak to me, except for you, okay, and my friends, yeah. right? Well, because we are friends and also because, as I said earlier, if I'm going to get the story, I'm going to go to the best sources to do this. And since the talking heads have already spoken, and I'm, I'm saying this in as kind of way as possible, there's already a controlled narrative on the record, and it's been there. There is also the open source record, which is out there, because as far as I know, as you pointed out earlier, um, most of the documentary evidence does exist on Project Avalon as well as on some other forums. Um, we do have a document that's going to be released between now and the time that I do the next interview, which is going to be with Shane, the ruiner. And we're going to, we're just going to put this on the record because I think the public needs to decide where they stand on this. As we're doing this interview, um, Contact in the Desert is going on in Joshua Tree. It's a pretty high value venue, uh, probably the largest UFO event of the year. And I think there's a lot at stake right now for the what, what we call the truth community is so deceived that I think we have to find a way to clear the room somehow. And the only way we can do that is to go back to ground zero and assess the situation and understand that the, I've been screaming about this since 2012, 2000, 2011, 2012, about the gatekeepers and handlers that are in the alternative media. And I've named the names. And there's some of the names that have gone through this interview today. That's a hard truth for people to handle. Because sure. we, 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 we're desperate for information. We're desperate for connection. We want communities. We want to have an official voice. But from my assessment right now, Christine, we don't have any of that. What we have is a sadly collapsing media platform and a, a disparate set of communities that are stumbling over themselves to preserve vestiges of their illusions rather than going for the hardcore truth on this. Well, I, I'm going to touch on that real briefly because I did listen to Emily and Elisa with you the other day. And I only have attended one comp conference and it was Awaken Aware in Los Angeles in 2011. I attended with them. And I was so sick those three days. I could barely get out of bed. I would go down for a few of the talks. I would become nauseous and have these horrible migraine headaches. And, you know, when you're involved in that closed in of an atmosphere, and it was Bob Dean and Henry Deacon and Jordan Maxwell and, you know, David Wilcock and Graham Hancock. I mean, yeah, David Wilcock and Graham Hancock. I mean, to George Norrie, to sit in that space. Uh, I actually got, because I'm going to use Corey's word, but it's a ridiculous label that he keeps throwing out. I'm an intuitive empath, you see. You can't be an empath and not be intuitive. It's a it's a complete label, and it's meant to hook people. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm I'm was actually like living in that whole and the astral field there, and the monitoring and the injection and I mean it was for me personally a, a great experience to have, but a really very hard one to have. So I think now there's, and it was supposed to be a Joshua Tree, you know, so now we're having this gone and we've got the Jimmy churches and, you know, all of these 
I mean, I don't want to have anything against these people. I really, really don't. No, I don't either. And I've said that, Christine. I don't have anything against them. The feel of this, though, is very much the launching of enterprises. And then the next, and we're, we're on the cusp right now. We're, hey, the, look, old generation, the old generation is turning over. And look, God loving, you know, we haven't heard from Bob Dean for a long time. I haven't, I spoke to Bob Dean in 2012. He's the only person I met at that conference that I felt had any integrity. The only one. Yeah. But, I mean, really, and I, I can't say I love Graham Hancock's work, but he was so in Mama Ayahuasca zone that I literally was on a trip with him when he was speaking on stage. I actually contacted Ayahuasca, yeah. and I saw the seduction of it, yeah. and I, I mean, it was like, you know, so, you know, it's not like anybody's inherently bad, you know, but they're there is a running narrative, Randy, and it is going into the money field. And that's my real big point here. Okay. Major, it's yeah. turned into a false reality. They're monetizing it. They're turning it into a business model. Corey's the cover boy for spiritual biz dot whatever, you know. Uh, and now he's saying, you know, we have to accept the dark magic, black, black magic Babylonian money system. You know, I mean, this is a total about face. Um, I think if anybody that might be listening to this that really wants to get into it is that you have, if you're going to listen to somebody like Corey Good or myself or Randy or Bill or whoever is out there, do some background. Listen to some of their earlier works. See if they're running, if they're speaking the truth, that there's a line of truth that runs through what they're doing, or see if they're changing their narrative at the next biggest opportunity they have for promoting themselves a website it, 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 and if you want to see that randy you know then you can start to use your own innate discernment and it is inside of us randy each one of us has access to all of it without having to have an authority scholar researcher priest whatever interpret it for us you know, so if we're ever to become free beings again, we have to honor ourselves in that freedom first. And like you said, have enough integrity and enough strength and courage to withstand, if you're a public person at all, the blowback you're going to get from that. You know, and I, I wouldn't recommend anybody that's not ready and hasn't gone through enough of their own deep inner processing to ever even consider putting themselves out there. No. And... It since you sort of went there, let's talk about this for a minute, because the most disturbing aspect of what I am now seeing in the Corey Good evolution has been the creation of the Blue Avian meme, which is really a savior program, and another external voice that's being added to tell. I, the way I interpret what I see coming from not just the blue avian meme, but almost any meme that has a savior aspect to it is, you poor stupid humans, you're too goddamn dumb to know who you are. You are cruel, you're warlike, you are animalistic, you have not ascended to the next level of your evolution. We are your galactic masters and we are here to aid you and guide you do this, which to me feels like more programming. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, how could you be wrong? Because it is programming. Anything that's in this field that you need outside help, it doesn't mean we don't get help. It doesn't mean that we don't have, uh, I mean, we're living in a living universe, if not multiverse, that has all sort. I mean, infinite numbers of manifestations of intelligence. Right. So, but if you're needing somebody else to interpret it for you or tell you what it's about, you know, I mean, the blue sphere being alliance, as a matter of fact, my, some of my conversations with Corey before we parted ways, we started talking about spherical beings and you can take them from the shape of an orb and you can contact a larger sphere of consciousness. Okay. Right. I mean, you know, you can, all of these things exist, you know, but to say, to, to, put it into a blue sphere being alliance and this is your savior and this is going to get you there is false. It has to be false. 
you know, and especially, I mean, I think in a way we could turn it around and say Corey's doing us a favor by showing us just how created it is, just how all the imagery is CGI. You know, when he told me that there were nine foot blue alien beings walking around his living room, at that point I'm like, wait a minute, okay? I mean, come on, excuse me. Uh, you know, this is now going into comic book fantasy. Now that does not mean that all of us don't have in our true DNA memory codes, which we haven't been able to access. Uh, we're part of this creation, and if we say we're creative parts of this creation, it's in us, okay? The reptilian race is in us. The avian races are in us. The feline beings are in us. They're not some savior galactic race that are coming here in spaceships to save us. Like, likewise, by the way, the Draco and Mantids are also in us, and I think we need to deal exactly. with that sometimes, too. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I have lots of contact with Simon Parks. Okay. Yeah. Long conversations with Simon. And you know, here, this is very interesting to put in here. I'm, I'm beginning to see the pattern of that when we have contact with somebody, their memory banks, whether it's mantis, uh, reptilians, feline, uh, I've met James Gillihan, I've, you know, I've talked to James Bartley. I, I, you know, these are all very valuable experiences in me because that contact with that person opened up my own memory or my own ability to contact these races, right? But my conclusion at this moment is that I have all of that here. It's in my memory here. You know, I don't, even the mantis beings, you know, from everything from being programmers, the technocrats are used for programming, to a very high consciousness, state of consciousness. The reptilians, they're not all the controllers, they're not all bad. There's, I don't know how many races of reptilian beings out there. Some of them hold high honor codes. Sure, yeah. And some of them are, 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 are vicious, but you know what, so's our world. You know what, so what much is the spiritual world, you know? I mean, animals eat animals. I mean, we're not the highest things on the food chain here, folks. You know, I mean, it, so when you start to integrate that in yourself, right, you're no longer looking outside yourself for the answers, you're looking inside yourself for the answers. And then when you find them, the outside reality will project back to you what you're discovering. Further contact, yeah. further gnosis, further information. But you gotta turn it around. Quit looking out there, look in here, and then allow to come to you that what you need to know next. And then the next level of that is to translate that into the personal experience and the personal insight and knowing of who you are. Mm -hmm. There's too much fascination with externalism. And mm -hmm. maybe that's because I'm kind of a compressed person within myself. I mean, the fact that I do these shows, this really is the extent of what I do publicly. I don't go out. I, I went to one conference in five years, and that was the Free Your Mind in Philadelphia that I went to in uh, April. And... Um, I don't find it meaningful to have a lot of exposure that's come as a result of what I do as it has, has with you as well. Um, but I, I get the sense that, that people think this is glorious and this is great. And this is the, the punch your ticket way to get to the top of some sort of enterprise. And again, you know, Right now, unfortunately, Corey's in the bullseye of this whole thing. Yeah. And this is there's a short shelf life for whistleblowers or disclosers or people in this media. The burnout rate's high and the mortality rate's kind of high, too. Um, so, the, you know, the authentic experience is the inward experience anyway. It's taking this, it's synthesizing it, it's pulling it together and making meaning out of it, which is communities. And I, this is where I kind of want to leave it with you, and you're more than welcome to fill in anything else you want to before we go. It's the building of authentic communities and how difficult this really is right now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's extremely difficult. And, you know, having gone from the forum to my own forum to online Skype groups to uh, interacting with other people in, um, you know, recorded uh, symposiums or whatever they wanted to call them, healing groups, all of that. Um, it's very difficult. If you have a few really good trusted friends built from there, I would say. Um, I've seen every group I've participated in to some extent once it started to get a, uh, a field, a generation of, of trust and transparency, get infiltrated uh, and taken out. And, and that's all okay with me at this point. Really, Randy, it is because it's all about learning, like you said. It's about the integration or the center, the you know, uh, synergizing within yourself, your own, uh, your own gnosis of yourself. And I'm a person that is fortunate. I mean, I'm fortunate because I've had enough past life recalls. I've had a, you know, all those little fragmented things that we go through our life, those little intuitive things, and they didn't make any sense. Well, they they've gelled enough in me that I see this being that I am currently inhabiting this body that I'm inhabiting currently in this time frame, right? And so I, I know that enough about myself. I don't, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm an evolved being. It doesn't mean that I'm better than anybody else. It just means that I know myself well enough, right? I know that I don't carry uh, intent to harm. I know that I don't carry hatred. I, you know, do I get blindsided? Yes. Do I make mistakes? Yes, right? My favorite activity right now is gardening and washing dishes, frankly, friends, because, you know, it's where I get my deepest intuitive uh, knowledge. When I have my hands in the dirt or when I'm out walking and I'm looking at the sunset, when I'm trying to work with I love with it. The I love it. I just love what you just said. Because, <laughs> you know what, if you really want to get cosmic minded, if you really want to do some inner work, go put your fingers in the dirt, do something mundane pet your animals, love your children, do the exactly. things that are uniquely human. We've gotten so cosmically minded, we're no earthly good anymore, to paraphrase an old quote. Exactly. No, and it is, it is that, because actually when you, and this, I'll just, my little, you know, synopsis of my experience of Standing Rock, I was so deeply immersed in the world of spirit there, beyond whatever I could have even thought of or imagined, right? So when you start to touch the spirit of things, of the animal world, of the elemental realms, of, of all of that, the snow, I mean, oh my God, I mean, the snow was one of the most purifying experiences for me personally, uh, to be in that icy, cold snow. So when I came back into Mexico and after I left Standing Rock, it took me two months to get out of the world of spirit and come back into this world. I was spending most of my time in a sleep-like state. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I was in a visionary world. So when you garden, when you hug an animal, when you caretake a child, when you do anything that is so mundane, sweep a floor, right? you're actually contacting the world of spirit because you, you, you've now taken the hive mind, the hyperdimensional mind, the program mind out of the scene, and you can open up those intuitive channels and they're subtle. You know, they're not gonna come into you as like, you know, the next whistleblower's testimony, you know, now you've got it, you know? Yeah. The big adrenaline <laughs> rush, but then, you know, you can't live on adrenaline. You'll burn your adrenals no. out. That's, that's what's happening to a lot of people right now. They're burning their adrenals out. Yeah. So I really thank you for giving me this opportunity, Randy. It's just like, uh, and I will say, you know, I, I carry such an amount of compassion. And all of that experience that I just explained took me into the realms of some of the deepest compassionate feelings I've ever experienced, including lucid dreams with other people that I felt had been betrayals and ab abandonment and all of that. So, you know, it's, I know when I can sit here and say, I'm not holding or speaking this to harm anybody, trying to, even them, like you said about Corey, I, mean, I still have an incredible compassion. And I also hold for him, and if he ever listens to this, that we were close enough, right, that he actually has the capacity to turn this into substantially understanding the deeper workings of, of this manipulative mind controlled world. He actually has that in his spirit. I've never lost sight of that for him, that he can turn this around. I mean, but it's dangerous now, right, Randy? I mean, anybody that's been that 
pulled into this yes. that tries it's to break dangerous. out of it is dangerous. Largely, I love you. And I love. I, I. I just thank you so much. And um, you know, when we when you put this up, perhaps you want to put some links to some of the on public record. Yes, so then we're going to do that. Yeah, then we're okay. going to put this up, and we'll provide links and as much documentation as we can to get people up to speed on it. Let people know where they can find you if they want to do so, Christine. Well, I have, I've got the Earth Impasse website. It's earthimpasse.net and also it's forum. And, uh, you know, I'll just like really quickly say, you know, one of the problems with Facebook is that you can never develop a long-term conversation on one subject or one thread. Everything just goes boom, 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 and it's out of public view. You know, so there is a, you know, there is a purpose for forums. Um, you know, if anybody wants to have a conversation there, I'm always available, you know, really, I mean, if somebody really wants to have a truthful conversation or try to understand their own experiences or share, uh, you know, but that's, you know, that's a field too, Randy, you know, it's fraught with all sorts of things. People come into your life and, you know, yeah. they're also running AI programs or whatever, and they can create a lot of, a lot of this harmony. So I'm very careful really now, right now. Do I let into my life? I am. <laughs> well, there's no no firewall around chaos and, and all of the attendant madness of the planet. All we can do is uh, no. be spiritual warriors on it. Christine, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing this. And uh, thanks for the authenticity and humility that you bring to this narrative. I think it's really missing. Yeah, that thank you. That that's going to wrap it up for this talk. Uh, we'll be back with another one real soon. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. OffPlanetRadio.com is the website. The truth is out there, and it really is inside of you. Now, go synthesize it. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Bye-bye. <laughs>